If you'll recall from the recursion module, we demonstrated how you could create a Java program that uses recursion to solve the Towers of Hanoi problem. Now, if you remember back to that problem, or if you see this image here, one thing that should one thing that should stick out at you is this is a stack of disks. And what we can do is we can utilize stacks to represent each of the pegs. And then instead of printing just directions for what to do, we can actually print out what the towers will look like after each disk move. So as a demonstration of what I'm talking about, suppose we want to move a disk from peg A to peg B. In fact, that would be the starting move. To move a disk, first we have to remove it, and then we have to put it on a new peg. So to remove a disk, we use the pop operation for our stack. That takes the disk off the peg, and then we add it back to a peg by calling push. So after I call a.pop and then push the resulting disk onto B, this is the result. Now I don't have to do that in two steps. I can actually do that in one step. Suppose I want to move a disk from peg A to peg C. Again, that would be the next move in the solution for the Towers of Hanoi. Well, I could just call C.push A.pop, which pops the disk from A, pushes it to C. And so this would be the result. So that's sort of the idea we're going to use in our example. So here we have our solve towers program. We're going to indicate that we're starting solving. We're going to call the solve method, and then we're going to print that we're done. So let's see what this looks like. And as you can see, we start off with four pegs on the tower. Then we move the top disk to peg B. Then we move the top of A to C and so on and so forth. And so you can see here, this shows what the towers look like at each time. Now, of course, you do have to rotate this in your head 90 degrees, but the idea is there. And again, if we had, for example, a method that would represent a stack vertically, then that would even be nicer. We could have something that looks more like the graphics we've seen. So again, you can see here at the end, we finally get all the disks in order on peg C, which is our goal. So how do we do that? What we do is we take the original solution we had and we add a map of stacks. And this is going to allow us to name our pegs. And we could either have this be a string or a character. We did a character so that we could call them A, B, and C, but we could if we wanted to make this a string and, and change the name. So in my constructor, what I do is I first set the total number of disks. Then I instantiate a hash map that maps a character to a stack, and I'm gonna have three pegs, A, B, and C, so that's the character, and then each of them all have their own stack to hold what's actually on that peg. Then, to put the disks on the peg, here I have a for loop that starts with the number of disks. If I have four disks, I call disk four the big disk, so I'll put disk four first. Then I decrement II so that I add four, then three, then two, then one. And to add that to a peg, I call the push method for that peg. So notice, I get the stack for the appropriate peg and then push a number. So my solve method just tells me that I'm going to solve this for however many disks I have and then my starting peg, my goal peg, and my temporary peg. And then the logic of the program is contained here. And notice it all fits on one screen of code, which again should be surprising. And this is after we add the stacks. I go ahead and get the starting and end peg from the map and then call them start and end peg inside the method. So if I only have one disk to move, then I know I'm going to move that from the start peg to the end peg, and then I'll print the towers out. Otherwise, I'm gonna move n minus one disks from the starting peg to the temp peg, and I'll use the ending peg as my temporary thing. So now when I did that, I have just one disk left, and what I'm going to do is move that from the start to the end, I'll print the towers because that shows my move. And then I have to move the pegs that I put on the temp peg to the end peg, which is where I was going for, using that starting peg as the temporary thing. Now, don't get tied up thinking, okay, so A is start, B is temp, and C is end. For each time this calls, notice those values get swapped around. Here, what was the starting peg becomes the temp peg in this call. And that's just because we move from peg to peg multiple times throughout the execution. So for my print towers, all I have to do is have an iterator on the map of pegs, and I'll print out the stack that's stored there. Now, 
this isn't the most ideal way to do this. I think a better way would be as if my two string method printed from the base of the stack to the top of the stack left to right. And so then it would just be a little more clear, at least in my view. And that's something that could be done using a stack and a queue to rearrange things. That wouldn't be too terribly difficult to do if I wanted to, instead of using the print line here, actually print that in a different order or without the top notifier. But to be simple, I just use a simple two string here. So that's one thing you could do to improve this. You could also, if you wanted, try to print out exactly what's happening at each step and keep all that neat in your output. And that's something I would recommend that you try to do just to see if you understand how this works. But again, here you can see an example of how we're using stacks, not necessarily to solve the problem, but to represent how our solution is moving.